started right away here. So today our topic is where will your website be in 20 years? And our speaker is Jacob Burma. Thank you so much. I am thrilled that you guys came. Uh, can I just get a show of hands? How many of you would consider yourselves primarily website designers? Okay, thank you. <laughs> awesome. You and me. Um, how about content writers, content creators? Okay, lots of you. Fascinating. Uh, what about developers? A lot of developers. Lovely. Okay. Surprise. Uh, but that's wonderful. My hope today is that you get a good hack out of this next talk. Maybe there's something you'll see that you haven't seen before that may be useful for you. Uh, what good is a conference if you don't have one? And speaking of which, I'm just going to put... So I've, I've talked to organizers and they gave me permission to take the WordCamp Vancouver 2023 website and save it for not just 20 years but 200 years. I did that this morning and it just needs one more file. I'm just going to go in here and I'm going to hit advanced. I'm going to make a manifest. I'll call it permasite. I'm going to hit next. I'm going to put it in that folder, create it. And it's free, and we're going to just keep that kind of in the oven, and we'll come back to it at the end of the talk. So where will your website be in 20 years? I have a bunch of slides. I had fun making them. I am a designer. Um, and they're all available at my website, vibrantcontent.ca slash WordCamp. So if you don't want to take notes, you can just go grab that later. So that should be fine. Uh, today I'm going to be talking about link rot. Now that's not maybe a popular topic, but it actually has some significance. As I thought about link rot, there are kind of two aspects to this. One is broken links on a site. This happens if like in WordPress you go to your permalink structure and you change it, which you should probably never do. But if you do and you don't redirect all of those links, all of your links go away. The content's there. If people come to your homepage, they can find it, but the links are broken. Second, more nefarious type is when the actual web content has changed and like someone didn't pay their hosting bill and the site goes away or pages are taken down. So not only did the links not work, the content is actually not discoverable online. To me, that's the easy two ways to think about link rot. And at first glance, like who cares, really? <laughs> like my website has some 404s, your websites have 404s, not a big deal. Wikipedia has the odd 404. But I think there's something beneath the surface. Broken and rotten links are a minor annoyance, but underneath they chip away at the assumption that the internet is is forever. I think instead the internet's like a huge glacier and it looks frozen in time, something that will last forever, but it's always, always moving and big chunks of it are calving into the ocean all the time. I love these graphics from perma.cc. When we launch a site, that's that first image there with no little red dots. The links are healthy. If, if a client notices a busted link, they'll tell us about it. And so the site goes live and everything works. And then about a year later, over 20% of cited links may be dead or otherwise inaccessible, according to their research. In five years, it gets worse. About 50% of cited links can be affected. Again, this is kind of beyond your control. These are things that you're linking out to. And then as time goes on, link rot is inevitable. It uh, continues and rarely reverses. How far does link rot go? Well, here it's really hard to get Canadian-only statistics, but here's what I found, specifically for the U.S. 20% uh, of all science, math, or uh, medicine, technology articles, the links are rotten right now. 50% of cited links in U.S. Supreme Court opinions are inaccessible. 70% of cited links in legal journals are gone. That makes me wonder why AI is maybe hallucinating uh, legal findings, because <laughs> all the links are broken. And then there are various estimates. I get. 72 to 98 percent of all content on the internet gone in 20 years. That means all the work we've done, the sites we've built. Where will your website be in 2043? Well, chances are it'll be gone. <laughs> and in some way, good riddance. Some of it needs to go. I don't miss Netscape, and uh, the world will survive cat memes. But in other way, it is a shame. And I want to just talk for a moment about my origin story with WordPress. Uh, about 15 years ago, I was living in Toronto. I was working for a mid-sized charity with about 20 employees. And uh, at that point, I was the communications director. And one of the th jobs I had to do was to build a website. So we found this high-end agency. They worked with the Toronto Raptors. They charged us like they worked for the Toronto Raptors. It was a six-figure price tag for a mid-sized charity website. Uh, we worked for nine months, tons of meetings. At the end of it, they were pleased to show 
a shell. <laughs> it was a gradient on the home page. It was a logo in the upper corner. It was about eight pages in the main nav, all of which were blank. Now it's time for you to put the content in. Like, are you kidding? Where in the 80 page contract did I see that you actually weren't going to put any contact in the website that we were making? And it was back in the day when boards used to show up for web launches. It's like, it's like inconceivable now, but here's the board flying in a few days and I've got this shell that I've got to present to them and it was panic mode. It was day and night. I've never made a website? Like, what are you kidding? And I'm, I have their proprietary CMS that's horrendous and I'm trying to put some photos in and it was, it was basically garbage but I didn't get fired by the board and I just came to the end of that experience like there has got to be a better way to make websites for charities than what I experienced. It felt like 90 minutes of work <laughs> that they did and then like days and days of my life. Uh, then I found WordPress and I started Vibrant Content, and we're trying to be that better way for mid-sized charities. And we've had fun clients from rural Zimbabwe to urban Mongolia, and uh, it's been amazing to work with them. And my kind of the main clients we're working with now are research institutions. And I just wanted to talk through the life cycle of a research website. So in the background is an actual one that has faded from the world, part of that, uh, the 98% that is gone. This is a Canadian professor who's well known. He contacted his professor friends in the UK and the US and they wanted to study ideology and how ideological conflict leads to geopolitical conflict. Really important topic. This was even pre-Ukraine and Russia. Uh, so he applies for grant funding from the government. They get the grant, huzzah, hires a bunch of grad students, they give us a small pile of money to make a website, and then they're hands off with creative. It's so fun, designer friend, because they're not gonna give you a lot of input, you kinda get to do what you want. Uh, they paid us to host and maintain the website for three years. Three years later, my colleague sends them a hosting bill, crickets, doesn't get paid, I follow up, oh, the, you know, the grant, it's empty. We can't pay you anything else. Uh, they didn't even have $75 a month to keep the lights on for the site. All that research. So we shut it down and the professor was on to the next grant. And it was so pointless. All this money, all this research, all this time for a site that lived 1,000 days online and then disappeared and no one can see it anymore. And it was link rot at its worst. So that's my own experience with it and I wanted to just kind of frame the rest of the talk with that and we're gonna move on to how do you solve some of these link rot problems. So I'm gonna shift this talk from problem to solution. Start with the basics, what's a 404? Uh, an error when a web page can't be found. Now some of you in this room may have coded plugins that fix 404s, so this may be repetitive for you. But for those of you who are new or looking for a way to stop link rot at step one, here's what you can do. Uh, I think the cool thing about 404s is that they show what pages users are looking for and can't find. So if you fix a 404, it's like, oh, this is what my users want to see. It's also great for your SEO. The sad thing about actually doing 404 work is it becomes an exercise in like, oh, look at all these PHP files that malicious bots are trying to find and can't find on my website. And that's like 90% of what you find when you do 404 research. But it's still worth doing. And there are many WordPress plugins to help you with it. I'm still a fan of the redirection plugin. It's cheap and cheerful. It's free. It'll find your 404s and you can fix them. However, um, it does tend to kind of go wild with 404 logging and you can bloat your site with that log and you gotta watch for that. Um, AIO SEO, sorry I misspelled that, and the Yoast SEO are both premium plugins. If you pay them a bit, then they can check your 404s and sometimes even automatically fix them. I'm also a fan of server redirects for the fix. It's just a lot faster to hit the server and go to the right place than hit the server, go to the site, go to the plugin, and then get to the right place. So I'd recommend that if you have a choice and your server and your host allows it. Uh, okay, so let's go up a level. What about external 404s? Okay, so what if you want users to not hit a 404 when they leave your site. Okay, we don't have a lot of control over this. In one sense, you probably don't care. It's not your problem. But in another sense, if it's Supreme Court citations, it does matter. And you'd want people to actually hit the content that you're citing. So here are a couple good references for that. I talked about PermaCC before. It's a project of Harvard Library. It's easy to use. It's gonna make you an HTML copy of a single page and a screenshot. It's kind of like a faster internet archive. Uh, the downside is you just get 10 links for free and then you have to start paying. So if you have an academic site with tons of links, PermaCC might not be the one for you. Here's another new tool, Archive Forever. I'm actually going to do a quick live demo of this. Um, 
it, and we'll see how this works. So Archive Forever is developed on top of Arweave, which we'll talk about in a little bit. And it is a free tool for now. I'm just gonna take the homepage of my website. I'm gonna copy it and I'm gonna toss it in Archive Forever. And I'm gonna include the screenshot, why not? I'm gonna hit Archive and it's gonna do a little work and it's gonna think about it. And then hopefully within a few minutes, it should give me a permanent URL of the screenshot. Now it missed the JavaScript and it missed some other things, but it did get something. And let's see if it's got the archive page as well. Okay, so it did well on the archive page and you can see this is a huge, long, ugly URL with Rweave in the middle, but it functions and Rweave would say it's around for 200 years and that's a permanent, permanent link that you can always go to. So that's a fun tool that's totally free for now. It hasn't been monetized and fairly new. Okay, let's go up one more level. We've talked about 4.4s on your own site, individual pages on other sites. What about whole websites and saving them for long periods of time? Okay, we're getting to the heart of it. Here the options thin out. You know about the Wayback Machine. It is an amazing tool. Uh, seven, excuse me, 840 billion saved web pages. Now, hands up if you have ever lost a page on a site and rebuilt it by looking at the way, yes, you have. Okay, that was a page. Hands up if you've ever lost an entire site, had to, oh yes, you and me. I have been there. It is, it's, it's painful, but it's awesome to be able to be like, how did I make that? And then trying to guess from the Wayback Machine. So it is a lifesaver. However, it's limited in scope. You sometimes only get one screenshot. I was trying to check a site and go down a level and get to their PDF, and you're just not going to find that on the Wayback Machine, and it's slow. So beautiful resource, and I hope it continues, uh, but it does have its limitations. Now, WordPress, as you may know, is getting into the permanence game. Pay them 38,000 US dollars, and they will give you 100 years of domain hosting and website hosting. I don't know if there's a line out the door for that one. Okay, <laughs> so is there a better way? Enter Rweave. This is a new protocol that I've learned about. Store data for long periods of time. It's a permanent data storage platform. Okay, so that's intriguing. My old business model is based on recurring revenue because I came to WordCamp and they told me to charge clients every month and I started doing it and they were right. But what if I could pay once and store a site for hundreds of years? That's kind of a game changer. So I started exploring are we during the pandemic as an arbitrage of my own business and my own business model and eventually got to know some of the early teams that were here in our weave and one ended up as a client R drive which is kind of like a Dropbox for our weave which you saw at the very top so how does our weave work well it's blockchain based so like other blockchain products projects it's decentralized it's self-sovereign it's immutably time-stamped but whereas Bitcoin's blockchain kind of just marches along in a straight line one block after another into a chain of blocks. Our weave uses what's called a block weave, which is a multi-directional, multi-stranded weave of data that's optimized for data storage and a very high redundancy. So as I understand it, if you upload a file to our weave, within a matter of hours, you can have around 800 replicas around the world. So right now there's about 150 terabytes of data on the weave but including all the replicas, the network size is something like 92 petabytes, like just massive redundancy for all the files that get uploaded. And they check the integrity of your file every 15 seconds and would say they have the highest level of data validation currently available. And all that makes it really, really hard to delete files that are put on Arweave because they're all over the place and they're copied and they're everywhere. So Arweave says they'll store your file for 200 years for a single price, but how do they pay people for two centuries? So that's the second part of their equation, the endowment. So when you upload a file, a big portion of that price goes into an endowment the way that big universities like UBC Solder School probably has, an endowment that pays the professor year after year, Arweave's endowment will pay data stores into the future. And we can talk more about that in the Q&A if you want to dig into that. So there's been big growth in the platform since 2018. Um, okay, but who's using it? Why haven't I heard of it? It's mostly been kind of some niche developers that have made gateway software or permanent data lakes or lots of infrastructure projects so far. It's also proved to be fairly popular in China because it eludes the great firewall. There's no one server 
a government can shut down because it's multipolar. Um, digital scrapbooking has been another use case early on where people can save their family photos for generations. And there are some business use cases because some businesses, you have to keep your files for seven years or 20 years or 50 years. And so if you can put them onto our weave, you know that they're around and you don't have to sweat it. So it's still early days in this technology. And I would say if you want a deep dive, uh, look up Sam Williams and listen to one of his podcasts or talks. I have some personal objections to our weave, having been around the ecosystem for a while that I'll just share briefly here as we get into this. Uh, there's an economic objection that I've kind of, it's in my mind. So our weave is a crypto project and it's dependent on the AR token, which is the native token of the our weave ecosystem. But how reliable is this token that they made? Well, I suppose the answer is time will tell. It is one of the larger projects in the crypto ecosystem um, and the endowment is designed to account for fluctuations in the value of their currency, but you know, I think the objection still has some merit and is worth considering. Um, I also have a bit of Betamax syndrome uh, about the Arweave project. Uh, if you aren't familiar with that or weren't alive, then Betamax was a competitor to VHS. It was better tech in almost every respect from Sony. However, it lost the popularity context to VHS. And now if you go into the back aisle of any thrift store in Canada, you see VHS tapes and not Betamax, so that's the legacy. Basically, the best tech does not win the day, uh, and that could be the same here. Time will tell. Uh, now, here's an interesting uh, nuance that you should understand about Arweave. So Arweave promises to store your data permanently for a one-time price. They do not promise to give you access to it permanently. Wait, what's the difference? OK, someone explained it to me this way. Let's say you're moving out of your apartment and you're going away on a long trip. You go to your friend who has a garage and you say, hey, will you store my stuff for a while? I'll give you 100 bucks. And your friend's like, sure, no problem. You go on your trip. It's great. You come back. You're like, hey, friend, I had a great trip. Oh, oh, by the way, I need to see some of my stuff. And your friend's like, whoa, whoa, buddy. You just paid me to store your stuff, not to actually let you get to it again. It'd be nuts. Like, you want to get to the stuff that you, it's actually yours. Uh, so, you know, in an alternate version of this, you go to your friend's house, but they're just never home, and you could just never get in to actually get to your stuff. So either way, I think there is a gap here in the Arweave world. I think they're aware of it. If you are a developer, like many of you in the room, there are open source gateway tools, so you can kind of make your own key, and then you can have your own kind of pipeline to get to your own permanent data if you want. But for those of us who aren't developers, uh, there's, there's an objection that I still have a concern. Um, lastly, emerging competitors uh, in 2023, Arweave is not the only person starting to talk about permanent data storage and, uh, and poke on people's frustrations about monthly subscriptions for hosting. Uh, there's another player out of India, Lighthouse Storage, that uses an endowment model very similar to Arweave but builds on Filecoin. And also the digital scrapbooking category, there's forever.com. But both of those options, as far as I know, are just for file storage. They actually won't store whole websites for long periods periods of time for a single price. Here's where I land. I think the objections to Arweave are very real, uh, but I also think it shows some promise and it's probably the only protocol today to have a serious claim on permanent data. So I think it is still a helpful tool to deter link rot. So now we're gonna kind of move from that introduction of various ways to store things online for a long period of time to a demo of how do you actually do this? How do you make a perma site and upload it for a long period of time? I'm calling this 10 Steps to Permanence. As far as I know, this isn't anywhere online. These are things that our small agency has just kind of come up with trial and error. And this happens to work and it happens to be good for clients and I will share some of the applications you could use with clients towards the end. Um, so this is what we do and the final goal is to have, like you just saw that one page, a perma site, uh, and you can compare that if you wish, our current site, vibrantcontent.ca, to an entire perma site I, I put in and minified the long, long URL to tiny.cc slash vibrantcontent. I paid 24 cents to do that. It was a pretty good deal. The site worked fine. Um, and I'll show you at the end how we got to that. So there's a few tools. Our weave is primarily for developers, but there are a few consumer-facing tools out there. Drag and Deploy, Archive Forever, R Drive, Acord. I'm gonna use R Drive because I'm most familiar with it, and I think it's probably the best tool in this case. Here are the 10 steps, and then I'll walk through what we uh, did at the very top with that one file. First, you're gonna build a static site. Now, this site is not going to be a fully 
functional WordPress site with the entire back end. So your contact forms aren't gonna work. It might not work for e-commerce. There may be ways around that, but at this point with this particular hack, it is gonna be a static site. It's gonna grab your JavaScript, so there may be moving things on your web page, but it's not actually going to be a full WordPress site. So that's apples to oranges a bit with what WordPress is offering. But it is still pretty remarkable. Next, you make an account, it's pretty straightforward, but you need to know it's self-sovereign data, so there's no corporation involved that can reset your password if it's lost. You, not your keys, not your file, so you've gotta take control of your own. I mean, the nice thing is no one's looking at what you're doing, and you really have it all to yourself really your own data. Next, you're gonna to go to our drive and you're gonna create a drive. I think I showed that earlier. It's just a matter of going to the big new button and then as simple as creating a new drive right there. And you can name it. Now, at this point, all drives have to be public. You cannot make a site private and have it fully functional and operating for 200 years. That may come later, but at this point, any site you put up is gonna to have to be public, which means you might wanna think carefully about what the future of humanity will see from our world. Uh, fourth, top up. So you're gonna need to pay, up until about maybe two months ago, you had to have the AR native token to be able to do any perma webbing, putting stuff on the permanent web. Uh, that's changed, now you can use a credit card and I think the minimum spend is five bucks. And so as an example, the site that I did, you get about a gigabyte for $3 Canadian. And my site, which the static files were 71 megs, became 0.03 credits and 24 cents. So you need to kind of feed the machine, but the nice thing is that you can actually do that and you don't have to find a crypto exchange that will actually give you this token anymore. Makes it a lot easier. So it's four or five is upload that uh, bunch of static files that you got with one of those tools, either Offline Pages Pro or Static Site. I didn't talk about those too much. I found that Offline Pages Pro, which is a Mac thing, works pretty well um, and tends to do a really nice faithful copy of sites, but static site, uh, yes, the static site generator also is good and there are many other tools that work with the CLI that you could use um, if you want. Simply static was the other one, yeah. Uh, so now that you've done that, you wait. So part of this process is when you upload files, not like Dropbox or you know Google Cloud where you upload things and they're pretty quickly available. In general, you'll need to wait Maybe it's a minute, maybe it's 10, even 30 minutes, depending on how busy the network is, to be able to have your files mined and propagated in many different places. So there is a bit of a waiting game, and what you want to look for is that yellow dot to become a green dot, which means you're good to go and everything's been mined. Step seven is what I did at the beginning. It's creating a manifest, and this is the special sauce. This is what combines all the perma files into one site. It's what I did at the beginning of the talk. Now, you have a lot more, they have a CLI for our drive for the developers in the room, and you can do some extra special things in terms of what you want your manifest to be able to combine together, and you can probably even put some functionality in there where people could use things like contact forms or even potentially e-commerce to be able to do more with your manifest, but this is just like out of the box if you're not a developer, this is what you can make. Trick is, I'm just going to note this, and again, this is trial and error from us messing around with this and figuring it out. The trick is you want to make sure that manifest is in the same place as your index.html file, which is like the key to a static site. You click on that and you get the home page. So just make sure your manifest goes there or it's going to manifest nothing. It's going to just uh, kind of go crazy. So um, we'll have a look at that in a second. After you've done the manifest, you need to wait again because that file now needs to mine and it needs to turn green light. And then finally, we can preview it. Let's see what happens, and if uh, our manifest is, it still looks like it's yellow, but that could just be that it hasn't refreshed, and let's see if anything has come from this. And if we have, oh, there it is, WordCamp Vancouver, yay. And you can see the huge, long, ugly URL up there. And if I click on another one, the same long, ugly URL with an about HTML is on the end, and that looks great. So now this site's been saved for 200 years for 24 cents, so that's pretty cool. Um, huzzah, there you go, and there's the URL. You can minify that as I did. Now let's talk about a few things, heads up. How, what's, what do you need to know? Okay, no delete button, like it's up. It's not coming down, it's all over the place now. Uh, number two, no password reset, I'll just say that yet again. Make sure that you keep your password where you want it. Static sites only, I'm not full WordPress yet. And I have had an experience where we tried to do a site which had Chinese characters in the URL. It's fine if you have non-English characters on the actual page, but if those Chinese characters in the URL, it's probably gonna go sideways and it might not work. Um, and then permanence, 
takes patience. You're going to have to wait a little bit. What are the applications for doing this? Well, good buy sites. So if you've had uh, a website end or you're refreshing a website, something you can say to a client is, hey, for X dollars, we'll create you a permanent version of your site that you can always have for reference. And a lot of our clients really love that. Like they want to be able to reference, especially what happens is you have a huge site and then a client wants to trim it down and be like, I want a site that's 25% the size and there's a lot of stuff I want to get rid of. But then two weeks later, like, well, what was on my old site? What was that file? I think just make them a perma site and like X dollars, I'll make you a copy that you can always access and you don't have to make it live. It can just live on our weave and then you can just go and always have a reference for it. Um, there's not another good way to do that. Okay, uh, client thank you, same thing. You've had a long relationship with the client, say a researcher, and there, yes, the project's ending, that's so sad. And you can surprise them with a thank you. Oh, you know what? We just, we decided to save your site forever and you can get back to it. Um, I, our, our agency now will build this actually into the contract. So when we talk to researchers, like here's phase one, you're gonna pay for hosting and then when your thing is done and your grant funding is done, there's kind of like a last payment for turning this into a permanent site that then you can keep. And that, they've been very appreciative of that and then they wouldn't know that their work isn't gonna disappear with the grant. Um, perma backups. So I'm sure many of you have good daily backups on your servers. I'm sure many of you hopefully have off-site backups, so if your server goes sideways, you've got one. Well, why not make 800 backups for cheap? <laughs> so this, you don't necessarily even have to do a manifest for this, like you don't have to create the file and have the working website, it can just be a static copy or it can just be your WordPress files. So we do that regularly and just make perma backups just in case things go sideways. Um, so yeah, and I would also say for developers, I am not one. But from talking to other developers, they would say, what if your code repositories uh, you know, were permanently available? You didn't have to rely on GitHub. You didn't have to rely on a PHP server. What if you could make apps and plugins where users got to choose the version they wanted because all the versions were available permanently? That's starting to happen. You know, Some people really get attached to an old version of an app or like functionality or it was before the ads came in. What if you could be like, I like I liked Instagram before the ads, and I want to use that version of it. Well, there's some cool new potential with what the permaweb could mean for apps. Uh, what if there's a WordPress plugin, you could press a button and have a static site generated and automatically sent to the permaweb, and then you could just kind of make a small payment and be able to do backups right from with WordPress. Or what if all of WordPress could be hosted there, and you could get a version that you liked and use it because it was already hosted and you could generate sites from that. Those things don't exist yet, but I think we're starting to see the beginning of what permanent data could mean, and it could be a big game changer for how we work on sites in the future. So if any of that's interesting, I'm happy to think about that or talk about that in, in Q&A. I will say I'm not a developer, so I'm not gonna be able to go too deep into the technicals. Um, so the current internet connects us across vast geographical distance. We have clients in Zimbabwe, Mongolia, that places I've never been before, that uh, it's been so fun to get into their worlds. What if this permanent data thing could connect us across vast spans of time so that people we'll never meet in the future can actually connect to us in our world here? I suppose that time will tell where that happens. So thank you, uh, I appreciate your attention. And if you have any questions either on LinkRot or some of the solutions I talked about or Arweave or wanna see kind of the steps of how we did those 10 steps to permanence, I am available for that. Thank you. Do you have the address for your presentation? Yes, I do, it's here on the bottom of the Q&A. Vibrantcontent.ca slash WordCamp are the, are the 10 steps. And you're free to send, fill out my contact form if you get stuck um, and you're like, that didn't work, I missed step six, or I didn't wait for this, that's fine, just let me know. Um, yes? Um, I know you said you're not like a developer, yeah. but just based on your own experience, how like secure in terms of privacy or data theft do you believe this is? Yeah, I think in my experience, so again, all of these are public. So all the websites I'm putting up 
are things that anyone who figures out that giant URL or gets a copy of it can see and it's not going to go away. So there's no privacy and I think our week by default is public and open because it's meant to be that kind of record. However, with our drive there is um, another encryption layer and they would say it's like military grade and pretty secure and you can actually set your own password um, for individual drives. So I showed you a public drive for those sites. You can also make private drives um, that only you have only, not only the password to get into your account, but a second password to get into just that drive and that content. Um, so yeah, I find that's fairly secure. Personally, I've put a lot of my family photos in private drives just so they're available uh, for future generations. Okay, that was exactly the next question. If I would transfer everything from, let's say, you know, an iCloud into this, I feel it is, but here's the thing. Um, I find that, e that there's like a cost comparison. Like, if you're going to put over 100 gigs, maybe even 50 gigs, whatever, or even up to a terabyte, like I think once you start hitting maybe over 200 gigs, 300 gigs, the, the price can get very high to make it permanent data, and it may not be, uh, like you pay monthly, but you'd have a pretty big major cost up front. So I find it's best for like your most valuable files or your most special files. I don't think it's at a point where it could be a complete replacement for um, Dropbox or Google Cloud, but the integration is coming. I think if, if we're here next year, I might have a different story. Yeah. Let's say somebody stores something in those websites, but legally, with a court order, yes. who can delete it? Yeah, so that has happened. Uh, there have been uh, takedown requests for pro copy protected material that has already been put up on the perm web. And, oh, sorry, I'm gonna repeat the question. I've, I was supposed to be doing that earlier. So the question was, if there's a court uh, order or a cease and desist letter that legally is sent from a jurisdiction and someone has put something up permanently, can it be deleted? Uh, the answer is yes with difficulty. And I know they have run into, there was a cease and desist letter from I think a major record label because some copy protected content was put up and made available and what you have to do is you can't coordinate those 800 copies. You can't actually get rid of those, but you can coordinate the gateway. So the guy who was in my my little parable who was, you know, storing your friend's stuff and he had the garage, you basically have to talk to that guy and say, okay, just don't serve that URL for that content. And they have a content moderation. Like, they want to be as permissionless as possible and open, but I know that there have already been some cases where they've had to um, just, like, the data is still there on somebody's hard drive, but you can't get to it because the URL's down. Yes. Um, th these URLs, are they yes. actually searched by any engines or are they kind of Yes, they are starting to be indexed by Google, uh, but they're obviously they are like the least SEO friendly uh, things you could possibly make because they're word salad. They're basically cryptographic hashes that are put around a central um, our weave or, or another gateway URL. Um, so yes, I've heard that they are being indexed and cached by Google. It's got almost a second layer. There's also kind of a new like Google for the perma web to be able to search content like that's just come out in the last month or so um, but it's not something you're gonna stumble upon necessarily there's also a thing of drive sharing so if like I have created this public drive of a few websites that I like and they're say permanently I can share that whole public drive as a single file like, or a single link. So I can just create one and I can share it as I want to. So that's another way that the content can be shared. But as of now, no, most major search engines, I think Brave might be interested in some integration if you've heard of the Brave browser because they tend to be more crypto friendly. They'll probably be the first one to have have some search capacity uh, can you for the use it For like a Git repo? Yes, yeah, yeah. That's the thing. Then, then you're not as tied to having to pay GitHub or, or host it or anything like that. Yes, so the Git, that's I think what developers are excited about is like, I don't have to pay monthly or whatever, or rely on this, I can just have it permanently there. So, yes. Yes. Um, and you said once it's in there, it can't be edited? But if yes. I want a new version of my site, it'll have to be. 
it would have to be new and you'd have to push it. So yeah, I was thinking about this scenario, in fact, talking to my friend about it earlier today. So in, <laughs> it's funny, so we have, and you might have these clients too, where for three or four years they have not changed a thing on their site. You're like, why are you paying me every month? For a site you can change that you're not changing. Like it is literally not changing. So we went to one of our clients and we're like, um, yeah, she's a, a former vice president of World Vision Canada and she does consulting and uh, you know, she just hadn't changed her site and we weren't sure what to do. I was like, well, let's just make it permanent and then you don't have to worry about it. Uh, in the end, she's like, oh, it kind of poked her to be like, oh no, I want to make some changes. I want to do some things. So what can you, how can you do that? Now again, the technology doesn't exist to be able to have WordPress hosted permanently, I think that's coming and something I'm interested in seeing happen and would love to talk to developers about. But um, what I think you could do is if you're getting a decent amount of traffic and you're paying for that traffic, you could have the permasite be the, the one getting the traffic and then you could just have a local copy <laughs> or a copy on your server of the one that, you know, and when they want to make a change, you just generate new static files and put them up. So that could be possible, but again, you have some long ugly URLs, you'd want to do domain masking, you'd have to, to push that out a little bit to be able to have it be like a coherent high traffic site, but um, it's a really, for those sites that don't change um, or that you want to kind of archive, it's a good, it's a good option. When you mentioned domain masking, does it affect your SEO? If That's a great the question. Yes. By yes. <laughs> yeah. So you pretty much use domain masking to direct them. Yes. Okay. Yes, I did, and I just used a free tool, Tiny CC. <laughs> but you presumably work with your DNS, and if they're DNS experts, they're welcome to chime in on how you could do that. Uh, and it may not be the best for your SEO, but um, it it would be cheap. <laughs> be real cheap. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes. Um, I guess, I'm not sure if this would be a, a common question for other people, but eventually you get to the point in your life where you start to think about estate planning. Yes. And if you've been in development and stuff, you've got these websites and uh, other things out there. Mm -hmm. and, and it already is quite a trend in terms of estate planning, in terms of getting rid of your digital footprint. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and I guess when I heard, saw this top heading, I thought, oh, maybe this is going to be the one that's going to give the answer. You know, I mean, <laughs> The whole thing blows apart because your domain addresses um, are, they're just rental. They're yes, fired, yep, anyway. exactly. Um, and as far as whatever's private, once you're gone, who cares? It might as well go public. Mm -hmm. um, but it doesn't really sound like this is fully going to address that now. No, there would be a few interesting potential use cases, like you could have a private drive, like thinking about your will or passwords or things, um, you could have those on a private drive and give just the key. And so you die and and someone gets the private drive with all your personal stuff and has access to it. There actually is an early consumer facing app called Sarcophagus that is designed for that. So I think it, I forget how it works, if it pings you or it looks for activity to make sure you're alive online and then if it doesn't get it, then it automatically releases the data you want it to release to a trusted person. So th that's kind of like next generation will planning or digital estate planning. So sarcophagus, our weave sarcophagus might be interesting to look at because they're, they're trying to figure out, they have a mechanism for mortality <laughs> to make sure you're alive. I forget what it is. I was thinking more for how to, how to sort of launch the um, websites let them go free now into the world. Oh, okay, oh, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. If there was something that would automatically take your websites off of domains yes. and then kind of make permanent versions like in a timed way, that'd be interesting. So they wouldn't all, the domains expire and the websites all die after you. Yeah, yeah. So that certainly could be a, a use case. Yeah, interesting. Yes? Um, I wonder if there's a way that when, when a page is not available and you want to show 404, instead you kind of redirect to that static copy uh, with the That would be interesting. I guess you would need your 404 to um, 
be intelligent enough to go to the right place. But what you, yeah, what you maybe could do, because I know there's some 404 redirection plugins in WordPress that just like every 404 goes to the home page. Like what if every 404 went to the permacopy? <laughs> so you could definitely, you know, explore the archive version. And you have like, you make the permacopy with like a top bar across the top, like this is an archive version of the site to get back to the original press here. And so someone could like, you'd create an internet archive for yourself kind of thing. But it, instead of the internet ar archive, it would be a searchable website that you could go through. That's a really interesting use case I never thought of. Appreciate your creativity. Yes? You, you mentioned endowment. Can you elaborate? Yes, sure, happy to. Uh, from Again, this is just from what I know being around the community. Um, so the Arweave team looked at the price of data storage over the last like 30 years. And um, as we know, it's what that, that rule in computer science, Can someone refresh me where the every number of years you get the same amount of data for half the price. Um, so they found the percentage was 35% year on year for the same amount of data storage, it costs 35% less on average. Now, when I read that, I was like, my hosting bill is not going down 35% every year. Somebody's making more money every year off of me. Um, so what they have done with the endowment is they're not assuming that hosting costs will be static. They're assuming that in 20, 40, 200 years, it's going to be a lot cheaper to host a 71 meg size site than it is today. But they have pegged it at 0.5% decline. So it's a very gentle slope down. And anything above 0.5% means that it's longer length of time. So the endowment is designed like if if the world keeps going and computer storage gets cheaper and cheaper slowly, then you get 200 years of storage. If it really dips and it's more like, oh yeah, 10% and there's these advances and quantum computing and all that stuff, then they would say the storage time goes out because the endowment has more in it to support longer storage. So that's kind of, um, and there's a, you can do a deep dive on, they have like a yellow paper that goes in the mechanics of it. Um, but that's what I understand from the endowment and how they continue to have funds to pay out for a number of years. Wonderful. Well, thank you all. I appreciate this. And uh, if any of you experiment with this and, and have any discoveries, please contact me. I'd love to hear what you learn.